Hello and welcome. My name is Larissa and I'm a nerdy freelance artist who loves Disney and drinks way too much tea. I've been working on a really fun commission and I decided to sort of document the process by turning it into a combination of speed paints and art vlogs going over my sort of creative and commission process. So on today's art vlog, I'm going to be talking about how I paint the texture of animal fur with a pattern like the stripes of a tabby cat. I've already talked about this same piece in several art vlogs and those will be linked down below in the description box, but this is definitely still a work in progress, so be sure to subscribe and ring the bell for notifications when I upload new videos, and while you're down there, give this video a quick like so that you can cheer me on in my progress. As with most things in art, it's usually easier to break things down into smaller, more manageable chunks. So don't get distracted right away by all the crazy different colors and patterns and textures that are happening. Go ahead and break it down. I start by laying a base mid-tone down over every section. If you're dealing with an animal that is all one color, like a white dog or a black cat, then that's going to be a pretty simple process. If you're dealing with an animal that has an overall white coat but then has large brown spots, then you can have obviously two different mid-tones. The area for the white section and then the area for the brown spots. In this case, only the cat's head is showing, the rest of it is going to be hidden behind one of the dogs, so I just laid a nice mid-tone brown over the whole section. I always like to work back to front to add to depth and dimension, so I'm going to start and work on the detail of the ear because that's towards the back of the head, and then I'm going to work my way forward in space. When you're painting somebody else's pet, little things like individual folds in the ear or specific spots can be very identifiable to the owner and mean a lot to them, even if it doesn't really mean much to you. So when I'm painting somebody's pet, I always constantly am checking my photo references just in case because I don't really necessarily know this animal that I'm painting or that type of animal, so I might not realize how important a specific spot or mark or whatever is, but but it could be very telling, so I like to definitely be constantly checking my photo reference. You may end up seeing throughout this video little bits where you can actually see my phone screen popping in and out of frame. Next, I start painting the face as if there are no distinguishing marks, stripes, textures, etc. Just painting it as if it is a solid animal by shading in different tones and values, getting highlights, reflected lights, cast shadows, etc. All of that worked in as if it is a flat tone. Once the base shape is all shaded, then I can go back in and start adding in the stripes and textures, making sure that where the under layer is lighter, I make the stripes a little bit lighter, and then where the under layer is darker or cast in shadow, I make the stripe darker there. That way it's all going to read as one continuous shape with shadows and everything flowing together seamlessly over different colored. The layered sections that are underneath that are the base color of the fur, as well as the stripe that is worked into the pattern. This is one of the cases where I have to take a little bit of creative license with my lighting and shading. I have six cats and two dogs that I'm working into this one painting, and they're all coming from different photo references that each have their own light source. So that gets a little bit crazy and complicated for me. I have a light source on each of these pictures of each of these different cats, but that's not necessarily going to all match across my frame of reference that I'm creating in this piece. So I have to figure out what each figure would look like with my light source in my piece while staying true to my photo references that I've been given for lightness. Yeah, that can get pretty complicated. So that's where some art basics like shading, cones, and spheres, and cubes, and whatnot that you do early on in your art training come in very handy. Once I have the whole furry face section done, I can move on to details like the eyes, but again, I'm starting with the same basic principle. I lay in a base green color that is sort of the middle ground for all the different colors happening in the eye, and then you can go in and add some yellows, greens, browns, etc. that will change the depth and different sections of the eye as well as shade in so that the eye looks rounded. 
I wait for the colored section to dry so I can get nice clean crisp edges of the pupil and then I wait for that to dry so I can put in the white highlights. Since I already have all the colors and paints mixed up for this cat, there are two other very teeny tiny cats that have very much the same sorts of colors happening, so I went ahead and decided to paint both of them next. Even though these two cats are obviously much smaller than the first cat, it's the same basic techniques. I lay down my base tones, shade all the different individual like limbs and head and sections as if they are their own section that is a flat colored cat, and then I go back over that adding in the textures and patterns of the fur. I use the direction and the curve of my brush strokes when I'm adding in the stripes to help add the rounded shapes and dimensions of like say each limb. So these cats are very very tiny, there's not a lot of room for detail. So having the stripes of these little cats that are so far in the distance was actually very helpful for me to be able to get that depth and form to them. I just had to take a picture of these two cats with my hand for scale because they're just absolutely teeny tiny and I just thought it was adorable. Once those three cats were finished, I moved on to the tuxedo cat. Painting anything that is black and or white is always a little frustrating, so painting a tuxedo cat can be very frustrating if you don't break it down into simpler sections. You can't just put down black and white because then there will be no depth, no form. You need to have those highlights, you need to have the bits of cast shadows, you need to add that dimension. adding too much to the black or white paint and it will no longer read as black or white. It'll start reading as gray or brown or something muddy. So it's a fine line to walk. I personally am a huge fan of color, but when you're painting somebody else's fur baby, understandably, they're expecting a likeness and they have an emotional attachment to them. So I definitely want to keep checking my photo reference and get that feel of a black and white cat, but still add enough shading to give it the dimension and form of a three-dimensional object. As a general rule, I try to avoid putting too much straight black paint onto my canvas ever. It always just ends up reading as like a hole in space, not so much a dimensional and physical object. So I prefer to use a lot of a dark charcoal gray, maybe even add in a little bit of brown when I'm painting a black object. Then I shade with various grays, adding little hints and subtle touches of color here and there, both to highlights and to the shadows. If you really look at an animal or a picture of an animal, then you will sometimes notice that there are brown tones if it's a little warmer black or blues if it's a cooler black. It's very rarely just like black. There's always some shifts of color and whatnot happening within the fur. So if you really, really focus on looking at your source material, you can bring out those colors and exaggerate them a little bit in your painting. 
When you're painting a pet portrait, there's definitely a huge gray area between exact likeness of your photo reference and the sort of emotional image that the owner has in their mind. I personally have had pets before in the past that just do not photograph the way that they feel like they look in real life. So often with a pet portrait, I will exaggerate just a little bit, sort of romanticize a lot like you used to do with like actual like portraits of royalty, but not so exaggerated. At 30 inches by 40 inches, this is a pretty large canvas, so there's a lot of room for teeny tiny details. For instance, some of the little tiny whiskers, I did not have a brush remotely tiny enough because I don't normally work on that sort of scale, so I actually took a much larger paintbrush, cut off just a couple of bristles, then taped the ends of those together to make myself some teeny tiny brushes for those little itty bitty whiskers to add that little touch of detail. I hope you found this helpful and inspiring. If you did, remember to like the video, but don't forget this is very much an ongoing project, so stay tuned for further updates. I hope you have a beautiful day, and I'll see you next time.